Well, people said, you may be seated. Well, friends, welcome to the Revival Centres, and we're going to be talking about that today, perspicacity. And I'm just down the front here with the roving mic. I want to see who can say that word. Jack? Perscapacity. Nice. <laughs> Matt? I already give up. <laughs> what about you, Jed? I've got no idea. Okay. Perscapacity. Pers capacity. Perscapacity. Pers what about you? <laughs> Perspicacity. Who thinks that's right? It's beautiful, isn't it? All right, who knows what it means? I put it up there because I knew you wouldn't know what it means. It's the ability that we have been given. Well, then generally, that word actually comes from two words. And it uh, goes back to Latin roots. And the first part of the work is about, uh, that word is about perception. And the second part of that word is about acuity. And so you piece it together, thus a brand new word. Now, that word has been around for thousands of years, of course. But what I want to talk to you about today is the purse capacity. And I'm not even going to say that word all day. I just I want you to forget that word, but I want you to remember what it means. See, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we are immediately given something that's extraordinary, and that is insight. And you and I will know of people that uh, wonderfully receive the Holy Spirit and they hang around for a while and they get great ministry and uh, you know, they witness the operation of the spiritual gifts and they get a little bit of an inkling on Bible prophecy and, and how the purpose and plan of God works. And what it, what it means is when we receive the Holy Spirit, you are given this, uh, I guess it's almost like a, a way of seeing things. And when you are uh, in life, when you go through various situations or problems or, or even when you just look on the news or, or your own life or our politics, who's looking forward to the next few months of uh, wonderful electioning? Not. It's unbelievable. But this word and, and this, this capacity that we've been given to see things is something that we need to develop. It's something we need to realise that once it's in us, it's there for good. It's kind of like a small voice, as we, we read in parts of the scriptures. And it's something that is your barometer. It is something that you refer to. And uh, when we come together, we are building our acuity in the Holy Spirit. And I want you to think about something in particular today. I want you to think about how you assimilate life. I want you to think about how you bring things in in your life and how you deal them out in your life, and what you make of things. I know of many people in my life that have been wonderfully filled with the Holy Spirit and the revival centres, and they've become weird. Because what they've done is they've allowed their insight, they've allowed the revelation of the Holy Spirit to go untempered, to be uncontrolled. And they become strange and they perhaps leave and go to other churches. And many people that do this sort of thing end up somewhere else. And when you walk up to them at another time, you bump into them, you ask them what, how they, they're going in life and, and how they perceive the Holy Spirit and this and healing and this and this and this and that. And they're way over, away from the Scriptures and the Word of God. And so what I'm saying here today is that we've been given this incredible ability, this insight into life this insight into the plan and purpose of God. And we've got to make sure it doesn't go askew. We've got to make sure it doesn't get the better of us. Because we are all victims of human nature. We all want a little bit more. There's a lot of one-upmanship in the human race. We see that in, in uh, Donald Trump and, and people like that. Not that I'm going to be political. Let's turn to Acts chapter 17. And this is um, something that uh, has been read many times this year, I think, in the revival centres here. But uh, just, I just want you to think about this purse capacity, the quality of having an insight into things, our shrewdness, our acuity, our astuteness, our insight, our acumen. And so this is, this is what we're on about today. In verse um, 16 of chapter 17. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans of the Stoics encountered him 
And some said, what will this babbler say? Others some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. And they'll bring us certain strange things, strange things to our ears. We, we would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. And then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For I have passed by and I have beheld your devo devotions. I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. The God that made the world that all things therein seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needeth anything, seeing that he bringeth to all life and breath and all things, and has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined the times hath before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own prophets have said. For we are also of his offspring. For as much then as we ought of the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like any gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of his ignorance God winked at, but now command us all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Now, I just want you to consider all that. Here's the Apostle Paul. He's wandering around in Athens. And I think uh, someone recently uh, mentioned how it might have been down at Freshy that uh, they had been to this particular place, Mars Hill. And these were philosophers. These were politicians. This was a gathering of people, learned gentlemen and women, and this was sort of like the, the place that you hang around when you want to talk about the big issues. And there would have been a crowd of people there. There would have been a crowd of people there that are just uh, soaking in the atmosphere. There would have been others sitting on the side playing their games. And there would have been kids over in the corner. And here is Paul wandering through there. He's full of virtue. He's full of promise. He's full of hope. He's full of the revelation of the Holy Spirit. He's full of that word. And here he is, he's compelled. He's compelled to say something. And he's compelled because his perception had changed. Because don't forget, the Apostle Paul was on the other side of the ledger before he received the Holy Spirit. He was a Pharisee. He was learned. He was in the upper echelons. He was revered. But the moment he received the Holy Spirit, everything changed. The moment you received the Holy Spirit, everything changed. The moment uh, you speak up, it's not because you have to. It's because you see the connections. You understand you have got the inspiration and the insight, the hindsight, the capacity to see things for what they really are. And here was Paul. Who's Paul? Going up against the leaders of society on many levels and saying, you're ignorant and saying, you, you worship him, the unknown God. And then he goes on, having uh, sort of kind of offended them already. And then he says this, this unbelievable thing. You know, he talks about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. He talks about how that it's going to change, it is changing, and the Holy Spirit is going to live in people. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. That is the insight and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit working through Paul. And all the people said. So we're just going to, I just want to mention a few things here. Paul, he trashed their traditions. He trashed their intelligence. He trashed their superstitions. He called them ignoramuses. Or whatever. I know I'm an ignoramus when I say that. Paul challenged the intelligentsia. Paul just had to do it. He had no choice because he was full of promise. He had the benchmark. 
He had the Holy Spirit in him. He could see the world for what it was. He understood that the future was in the Holy Spirit experience and, and lay within. And that every person needed to do it. Get off the hill. Stop talking rubbish. Stop talking uh, similitudes and, and false doctrines and all kinds of things. Just follow the Lord and receive the Holy Spirit. I want you to think about this. The moment you receive the Holy Spirit was a moment that you can never retract from. I want you to think about that. Yeah, you can leave the revival centers. You can head off somewhere else. You can go back into traditional churches. You can, you can run away and spend the rest of your life drinking away your sorrows because you knew you shouldn't have gone. But when you, I've jotted this down, when you come to realize that you're a son of God, when you come to know through the baptism of the Holy Spirit that your sins are forgiven, when you've given this capacity to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, you are full of insight. You are full of hope. You have a, a measuring stick for everything. You can see through politics. You can see through the media. You can see through the, the flawed social media. You can see things for what they really are. And I dare say it, what a privilege. What a privilege. You know, I, I was watching uh, Richard Attenborough. He's, he's the, you know, the, the man that does all things with animals and that. And who was it the other one? David Attenborough. What did Richard do? He's... Okay, got it. All right. Okay, I lacked a little bit of perspicacity then. But anyway, I was watching him on the Discovery Station. You know, it really annoys me. And they, they talk about evolution like it's a given. Yeah, when I know that evolution has its, its inflections and, and they'll say it 50 times, you know, the evolutionary thing that happened. And I'm thinking, how on earth did it grow that extra eye? When did that, that thing decide it needed an extra tentacle? What's the, what's the jump? Did it say, mm, goosh, and then drop dead because the other one didn't work? You know, and, and, and what I'm saying here is that in the world that we live in, there is so much rubbish that is taken for granted. And, and everybody just accepts it. So much rubbish when you go to a funeral. The things, not just what they say about people, because everybody gets, gets huggy and feely and they say all nice things, even if they're not true. I'm talking about when they're talking about what's going to come next and this person, this is going to happen and that's going to happen and this and that and this and that. It is just rubbish. And I hope you agree with me because we know it's rubbish because it's written in your heart. You should, you're a vessel of truth. You're a vessel of honesty. You're a vessel of integrity. You're a vessel of purpose, perspicacity. You're a vessel of the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And to step away from that, when the Word of God says, but I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things that God has got in store for us, to step away from what you already know when there's a promise like that is ridiculous. We've just got to keep it in check. 1 Corinthians 2. I sound a bit grumpy, don't I? I've been coughing for three weeks now. It's good. Who's had this cough that's going around? Mate, I've got strepsils in my ears and I've got, um, I've got a camel foot hanging around my neck. and I've tried everything here to get through today. Ah, 1 Corinthians 2. And, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto the testimony of God. He didn't use big words like perspicacity. Okay? And it says, Therefore I determined not to know anything among you save Christ Jesus and him crucified. Now, what a, what a, a concise statement. Because if you know about that, because you've received that, the word of God says that we become witnesses of the resurrection. What else do you need to know? Because it's the power of God, it's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it's the sacrifice, it's the resurrection that brings everything to an head. Is the solution to all things. So what a statement the Apostle Paul put there. 
And I was with you in weakness and in fear, in much trembling. And it says here, and you go, and, and like that where I said there, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Look at verse 30 of the previous chapter. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, whom of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. It's a big issue. It's not just a throwaway line. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the power of it and, and the power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Thank you, Lawson. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them, that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the, of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. That is insight. That is hindsight. That's perspicacity. That's the ability to, to get all of the links as you're moving through life and as you're looking at the news and you're seeing this and you're, you're seeing global warming and this and that and this and that and you know the solutions. You can look through the rubbish. You can filter out all of the endeavours of mankind that aren't getting people anywhere and what you've got inside you is this, this, this amazing system of filtering what is righteous, what is right, and what is true. It says here, but we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom. We read that before. It says, which none of the princes of this world knew, for they known it, for they had known it, if they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And that's this verse here. But as is written, I had not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. And what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. And we might know the things that are freely given unto us. You are a Spirit-filled vessel. You have been anointed by the power of God. And you are full of solutions. And you are full of answers. And sometimes we, we can get a little bit confused and a little bit sort of perturbed that we're not witnessing enough or doing this or doing that. No, just consider what lies within. I'm not just talking about the wonderful feeling of speaking in tongues and, and building yourself up. I'm just considering that every, each and every one of us has this capacity to piece it all together whether you're 15 year, years old or 80 years old, in your way, through the Holy Spirit, you have the capacity to process life and process all of the answers that are necessary for every person that you come into contact with. People need to know that. People need to see the hope in us. People need to understand that you, you, there's something about you. You know, sometimes it's used, uh, you know, people say, oh, that guy's a good businessman, he's got business acumen. Or this guy's a, or this lady, she's, she's very wise. No, yes, perhaps. But you and I are full of spiritual ac ac acumen. You and I are full of solutions. You and I get it. You and I understand that right across the world every Sunday or Saturday or whenever it is, there are people out there fighting wars in the name of religion, but they're not fighting for the Holy Spirit. They're fighting for traditions. And as Jesus, uh, sorry, as the Apostle Paul stood up there and, and challenged the authorities at Mars Hill, he went on to say that it's going to be in people. People of hope, people of glory, people of the anointing, people of purpose, people of promise, people that get it, people that understand that this is not just a game of being good and playing church and doing things by constraint. Being righteous is a blessing. Being righteous is a liberty. And extending that offer to others doesn't get any better than that and all the people said okay the funny thing is do you know there's a lot of weirdos in religion 
Who's noticed that? You're looking at one right now. But you see it all over the world. There are people that uh, start off well sometimes and, and they feel that they've got hindsight and, and spiritual acumen and, and a bit of a revelation of the Holy Spirit. But you see it time and time again where it just goes, they go belly up. They, get, they go stupid. And so today, you know, just in talking about this, I also want to just step onto the other side of this. Being inspired and being full of revelation and full of hope. How do we stop ourselves from going nuts? When you see a world that is crazy, when you see a world that is, is just so confused without hope, how do we turn that purse capacity inwards? It's the hardest lesson of all. Because I know, you know, you know, we sit here every Sunday and, and somebody here, you know, you, you, there's, you know, I might have made a point about something and you're sitting there and you're thinking, I hope, you know, I can't think of a name now, Josephine, no, um, there's a Josephine there, um, Georgina down the road is listening to what PS is saying. She really needs to change. Or you hear something in the gifts and you go, look, I hope Fred Bloggs is listening to that today because he's got an issue. How do we, how do we be better at self-adjustment? That's got to be the greatest thing we can pray for. Because all through the scriptures, it talks about wisdom and understanding and all this kind of stuff. And I jot it down the bottom here. We can be incredibly intellectual. We can be incredibly spiritual and it's, it's interesting, you know, because there's a difference between intelligence and intellectual. An intellectual person knows lots of things, but isn't necessarily intelligent. I'll give you an example. Pastor Frank Nankerville. I can talk about him because he's not here today. But Pastor Frank, as you know, I'm his son-in-law, and he used to do a lot of things by hand. He was an incredible guy. Built up mud brick house with three roofs because of the it took so long that the others warped and all that sort of stuff and he took a week off work years ago and he used to have this VW the original bug and he used to drive it down to Fisherman's Bend where he worked at ARL as an electron microscopist. and um, he'd been there for two days and what he was trying to do was put the engine back in this car and somehow he'd managed to get the engine out. He had a, a winch thing there and he, he'd done some work to it. And for two days, he was trying to get the engine back in. And smart aleck me, I just walked up and said, why don't you unbolt the hood? And he got it in in 10 minutes. Okay, now that's not a big lesson for us, but, but what I'm saying here is that we can be so immersed spiritually we can be so immersed in trying to second guess what comes next that, w that we can be of no spiritual use to the lord right now let's read something a little bit like that we'll go to matthew 24 and this is just a, an amazing warning you know rumors of wars and all that kind of stuff and it says here in tw verse 21 then shall there be great tribulations as, the, as was not seen since the beginning of the world to this time, nor, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days be shortened, there shall be no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall, shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that... If it were possible, the, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you this before, and it goes on. And then it goes on to talk about how when the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to know about it. He's not going to be coming through the back door. He's, the, the whole world is going to know. But my point in bringing that up is we've got this fantastic list, list about wars and rumours of wars and beginning of sorrows and nations against nations and all kinds of things there. And then tossed in the middle is a little warning for God's people. And that warning is, keep it together. Don't get stupid. 
Don't be over the top. Be balanced. Use the Holy Spirit in you. Use this purse capacity to, to its nth degree. Understand that you represent the moderation of Christ. Jesus and the Apostle Paul, they weren't racing all over the, the place, making false claims and, and worrying people. They were showing the truth. You show the truth. You show the truth in the words that you say, in the confidence that you exude, and the way you deal with life. But if we're jumping all over the place... From one thing to the next, like we see in much of the Pentecostal world and from America and Canada and all this sort of stuff. It's a shocking testimony. We need to be grounded with our insight. We need to understand that we've been given a, a, a clarity, and I love this topic, a clarity and acuity and acumen. We've been given such valuable tools so that we can ascertain what is righteous and what is right and what is spiritually logical. You know, people can be incredibly spiritual, but not necessar necessarily have a spiritual IQ. You can be so unwise. We are wise. And all the people said. Let's go just to um, 2 Timothy 2 to finish. All right, just, just in concluding, before I read this, all together now we're going to say that word. All right, one, two, three. Oh man, that was terrible. Who would rather just say insight? Okay, all right, 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2, it says here. Oh, there's the cue for the, the backing singers. Where are you going? Okay, okay, all right. Verse 15, 2 Timothy 2, study. And that actually doesn't mean just sit around and read, read, read. It actually means be diligent. Be diligent to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I see, and I'm, I'm reading it in a calm way because there's such a strength and there's such a foundation to that advice. And it says, but shun profane, that's common, and vain, that's empty, babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. You know, I remember years ago before we came up to the Y2K thing. You know, people getting twitchy. People thinking the end of, it was the end of civilization. People were going home checking their VCRs to see who was going to chew the tape up and spit it out across the room. It was all over. And their word, sorry, and their word will eat as doth a canker. And like a canker is like a sore that just kind of, it's like gangrene, it just doesn't get better. And their word will eat as a canker of whom is Hermetius and Felicius, and that's their heretics in the early church, who concerning the truth of urge, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So... What we're saying here today is be balanced. Because in the balance, that's a wonderful testimony within itself. You know one of the most balanced people I know in my whole life? Pastor John Marshall. I'm sorry to say that. He's red. He's just fallen off the chair and he's just, uh, you know, impaled in his, in his uh, thing. But over the, my time as a pastor, he's always the guy you could walk up to and he says, it's okay, Simon. That's just people. That's just life. And my dad used to have a saying years ago, and it's kind of what led me to talk about this today. As a pastor in the church, you see people that, that just love the Lord and they're going beautifully and it's humming along and the engine room's, you know, getting topped up with fuel and life's good and they're witnessing to people and their next door neighbours are getting thing and they're getting blessed at work and all this kind of stuff. And then something happens. Say they lose their perspective. They lose their understanding that, that we're in this for the long haul. And our short lives, whether it be, you know, we've, we've upgraded a bit now to four score and ten instead of three score. But our lives, it's, it's, just a, it's just a glimmer. It's just a speck when we think about the future. 
And so my talk today, in talking about that wonderful word, purse capacity, is just manage and understand that there's something in you that is so valuable and how you perceive, how you conduct, conduct and how you engage your lives. It's such a blessing to have the Holy Spirit within us. And all the people said, let's bow in prayer.